What would you do if you were turned into a weapon? You're isolated from most of the human community, which regards you with fear and suspicion. Every aspect of your life is strictly controlled by an organization that has little regard for you. Worst of all, you live with the knowledge that you will almost certainly lose your humanity and become a monster. If you're lucky, you'll be killed by your own comrades before that happens. If you're unlucky, you'll live that way. But at least until then, you can live with the knowledge that you're performing a noble service to protect humanity from the monsters you have hybridized with, only to learn it's all a lie. Your painful self-sacrifice is not for a noble mission. You are instead part of a military experiment, a pawn in a great game, part of a war in a world you never knew existed. Welcome to the world of Norohiro Yagi's Claymore, and if you want to know how to create an all-encompassing world of horrors, but still somehow give your reader hope, you need look no further than this severely underrated series. Claymore was such a horrifying world, and yet it was also surprisingly hopeful. How did Norohiro Yagi create such a seamless story out of such a contradiction? And what does it say about the world we live in? Let's begin. The basic premise behind Claymore is that there are monsters in the world called Yoma. They are physically superior to humans and consume humans as their prey item. And to make matters even worse, they can hide among the human population, so they're almost impossible to find. The only way you can reliably combat them if they're in your town is to hire what humans call a claymore. And these warriors are all women by the time the story begins. They are physically superior to any normal person and can find the Yoma hidden in the crowds, which is the most important reason why towns hire them. But there is a downside for a human becoming a claymore, and there's a big one. The organization creates these warriors by a horrible surgical procedure that inserts the flesh and blood of a Yoma into human bodies. And you can quickly see that the patients in this procedure are all very young. So this experience is excruciating and it leaves the girls scarred for life. But through this horror, you also see immediately that there is hope. The narrative is presenting you hope amidst these horrors at the start. The terrible pain that these girls go through tends to forge incredibly close bonds between them. But these bonds aren't created through the design of the organization. You would think that it's done purposely to create better unit cohesion, maybe, but it isn't. It's just incidental. The organization does not care about its warriors. They are only tools to carry out its purposes. In fact, if the warriors become too close to one another, they might get ideas and rebel, because obviously these claymores are far superior physically compared to the normal humans, the men in black, that run the organization, so they can't let these women get any funny ideas. So this is why the organization fosters suspicion and mistrust between the warriors under its employ. There is even a specialist anti-warrior, the organization's number 10, who is specifically trained to defeat rebellious warriors, and Hers is the loneliest life of all these lonely lives. She has no friends and never leaves the organization's headquarters, so she can't even interact with normal humans. The only people she interacts with are these cynical men that uh, run the organization. The organization has to keep her isolated this way. It has no other option. She's the warrior of last resort. But you have to ask yourself, why does the organization treat its warriors like this? Why doesn't it give them more leeway? Why doesn't it foster better friendships? Why is it so afraid of rebellion? After all, it's supposed to be the good guy, right? It's supposed to be the last resort that humans have against the Yoma. So is it 
acting so cynically for some greater good, maybe? The answer, of course, is no. It's just a cover story. The whole thing is a con. In fact, we learn early on that the towns that can't or won't pay the organization the exorbitant fee for killing Yoma tend to get wiped out by a horde of them pretty quickly afterwards. So what's really going on here? It turns out that the organization created the Yoma in the first place. But this isn't just some convenient scam to make money. It goes way deeper than that. The organization's purpose reveals why the warriors are treated with such little regard. Both they and the Yoma are nothing more than pawns in an experiment. But this experiment, which is meant to solve one problem, only winds up creating even more problems for the organization. And they kind of deserve it, but a whole lot of people suffer because of it. And that's what we're going to talk about next. You might not know this about me, but I am actually a political scientist by education. These days, I don't know why I did that, but I did it at the time because I thought I would eventually become a lawyer. Again, I don't know why I was thinking that at the time, but that's what I was thinking. Thankfully, that didn't turn out to be in the cards because I would have been bored to death. But it does allow me to appreciate Claymore more because part of my education was in international relations, and this is primarily what I write about today. A lot of people say that Claymore declined in the second half of the story, and yes, that is true to a degree, but it still maintained its theme of finding humanity and hope in a world of horrors, and the series did this by showing how the people and the warriors were pawns, expendable assets to be used for the organization's strategic advantage in a war taking place far away. I hope you will forgive me for being a little technical in this part of the video, but it should help you to better appreciate this story. I'm not sure if Norihiro Yagi intended this, but Claymore is really, when you get right down to its core, an expression of the realist view of international relations. The main ideas in this view of the world are, one, human beings are self-interested primarily, and this is more important for decision-making than moral considerations. Two, states and not other entities like international organizations, businesses, NGOs, etc. are the primary actors in international relations. Three, states pursue power to achieve their interests, especially their security interests. They must rely on their own resources to do this, but they often align with others to attempt to contain the power of other states that threaten to achieve supremacy in the international system. And finally, perhaps the most important uh, part of this theory is the fourth point, and that is that the international system is anarchic. By this, I mean not anarchy in like a Mad Max world, but that there is no ruler to force states to obey laws. States are therefore free to pursue their self-interest, and power is the only thing that can prevent them from doing so. One example I'll briefly talk about is the South China Sea dispute. Uh, to make a long story very, very short, China has claimed most of these waters, even though they're a long way away from their homeland. And an international court rejected these claims in 2016, but China basically said, good luck in enforcing your order, and has continued as if it never happened, fortifying islands, harassing the navies and fishing boats of other countries in the area, etc., etc. The dispute is very complicated, and if you want to know more, you can look at my archive that I link in these videos, because I have a number of scripts about them. But... Why is China doing all this at the end of the day? It's because it has the power to do so, and the other countries in the area don't have the power to stop it. Again, if you want to see more, just look at my scripts. So that's basically the world that we see in Claymore. 
If we go to part two, we find that the world the warriors know is just an island. On the mainland, the organization is at war with a mysterious group allied with a people called the Dragon's Kin, and the organization appears to be losing. So it had to, in a way, retreat to the island the main Claymore story takes place on and use it as a weapons lab. But unfortunately for the organization, its experiments to create warriors that could rival the Dragon's Kin on the mainland backfired in several ways. Their goal is to create a monster of some sort that retains its human mind and can thus obey the organization's commands, but as we've seen, the temptation for a warrior to become a monster and then start preying on humans is very high. The warriors that do become monsters are called awakened beings, and they're totally outside of the organization's control. So three of these awakened beings are so strong by the time the story starts that they have established basically rival spheres of influence on the island. So the organization can't even effectively control its supposed safe haven weapons lab anymore. And each of these three awakened beings are called Abyssal Ones. Each one has its own region, too. You have Easley in the north, Luciella in the south, and Rifo in the west. Meanwhile, the organization controls the east. So what we have here is a balance of power, and this balance of power mostly keeps the peace. None of these entities can advance without putting itself at a disadvantage because the others would have an opportunity to exploit. The three Abyssal Ones seem mostly okay with this, but the organization obviously isn't. It needs to find a way to regain control of the island. So you can see that the warriors in Claymore are all just pawns trapped between these much more formidable forces. They don't have the power to influence this system. They are just individuals. They aren't on the level of a state. But the main characters in Claymore, and this is very inspiring, they don't let their lack of power determine their fate. They don't see themselves as being victims trapped in a world they have no power to change. So hope, you can see, is present in this cynical world, this great game between great powers, and this hope will create miracles by itself. And it all started with one little girl. Religion seems to play a big role in the lives of the people on the Claymore Island, and one of those belief systems centers on the twin goddesses of love, Teresa and Claire. Maybe you won't be surprised when I say this, but the inhabitants of the island revere these goddesses. Why wouldn't they in a world that's so monstrous, right? As it turns out, there's one Claymore warrior that stands above all the others. This is Teresa of the Faint Smile. She's so powerful that she can defeat an Abyssal One while using only 10% of her power. So, in other words, she has enough power to end the stalemate and restore full control of the island for the organization. And when you first meet her, it seems like there shouldn't be anything that stops her from doing so. She's cold-hearted and ruthless. She lives for nothing but killing Yoma. She has no friends, and her biggest thrill seems to be telling stories that scare people. This should be the ideal weapon for the organization to use and retake control of the island quickly, right? But it can't, because it has no idea that Teresa has this much power. She went to great lengths to keep it hidden from them. Why? Because deep down, Teresa is hurting really, really badly. She hates the organization, she hates what it did to her, she hates that it stripped her of her humanity, and all that anger toward the Yoma is really just a sign of how depressed she really is. She has nobody that can comfort her either. It's not like she can go to a therapist. 
even if she wanted to, no one would take her. She's completely isolated from the human community, remember. But there was one little girl. Teresa saved this little girl from a Yoma who was keeping her around as a torture object, as a plaything. And the girl seemed to want to show how grateful she was to Teresa for this. But Teresa responds by kicking her again and again. And yet the girl wouldn't quit. She continued to move toward Teresa despite the pain. She followed her into the wilderness. She even wound up jumping off a cliff to continue to be near her. And at that point, Teresa saves her life again because warriors like her are forbidden from killing humans or being responsible for human deaths. It's the only way that people can trust them. But then this girl who Teresa was trying her best to get rid of actually spoke. As it turns out, the girl saw Teresa's naked body in an incident involving bandits. Teresa's body was disfigured from the process of taking the flesh and blood of a Yoma to become a Claymore warrior. This process hurt a lot, but the end of the physical pain was far from the end of the actual pain because the emotional pain was still there. And that's when Teresa finally figures it out. The girl wasn't seeking comfort, she was giving comfort. This small girl, who's not even half my size, taught me that tears can flow even from these silver eyes. The girl's name was Claire. Teresa and Claire then bond, but Teresa expects it to be short-lived because she attempts to drop Claire off at a well-defended village so that she can live a good life as a human being. Claire doesn't want to leave her, but eventually agrees at her insistence. Unfortunately, Teresa neglected one thing. By destroying the Yoma in this village, she opened it up to an attack by the same bandits she and Claire ran into earlier. Now Teresa has to make a terrible choice. Take human life to save Claire and be outlawed by the organization, or leave Claire to her fate. It might be a terrible choice, but it is not one that she hesitates to make. She would rather save the girl that finally let her be human again and feel human emotions and make human bonds than sacrifice her for the organization she hates and that doesn't give a shit about her. In one of the most striking scenes in the series, Claire wakes up on Teresa's lap. The two look at each other like a mother and daughter would, and the corpses of the bandits Teresa slayed surround them. To make a long story that you should read short, Teresa is then called in for execution, but she easily incapacitates her executioners and goes rogue. She doesn't care about the organization or about using her power to change things on the island. She just wants to live a peaceful life with Claire. Unfortunately, this would have devastating consequences because the organization called the four highest ranked warriors below Teresa to hunt her down and kill her. And for most of the subsequent fight, things looked like they would go Teresa's way. But then, the youngest of the four, Priscilla, lost control of herself and awakened after Teresa spared her life. This was an extraordinary moment because the organization expected Priscilla to be powerful enough to surpass Teresa one day. But yet again, they misjudged Teresa's power. 
Teresa defeated Priscilla in her almost awakened form, but then let her guard down and, well... Now this felt a little bit like an illusion-breaking experience because it was obvious that the plot couldn't move on if Teresa lived, so it felt a little too convenient to get rid of her this way, but you can overlook this because of how powerful the emotions in this whole journey were. And Irene, or Elena, depending on the translation you read, the only other survivor of that day besides Claire manages to paper over the slight break in the illusion by telling her And this is why the Teresa arc might just be the best individual arc I've ever seen in a manga or anime series. I, I pronounced manga wrong, okay. <laughs> to, the, to this day, Teresa is one of my favorite fictional characters. In this terrible world where horrible things happen and people are just pawns in the game of the great powers... Teresa and Claire manage to find each other and build an affectionate relationship. And Teresa goes from a depressed, angry, inhuman person to embracing her humanity again, despite becoming basically a monster. And this is what I meant when I said Claymore was a great example of charismatic storytelling. What is charisma, you ask? There are a lot of definitions about this, but one of the more memorable ones I've come across comes from Joseph Roach, who is a performance studies scholar at Yale. He defined charisma as the ability to convey contradictory impulses like grandeur and humility at the same time. So a good example would be somebody like Joan of Arc. Here was a woman performing a male function and doing it better than most of the men of her time. And yet she was also somebody who was claiming to be hearing voices from heaven and acting like it, while also being a peasant girl that wasn't well educated compared to the officers she now commanded and exceeded. So Claymore conveys these contradictory qualities in the best way. We see the horrors in bloody detail. We see how every life on the island is subject to the great game, to this anarchical competition between the great powers. But at the same time, you see how even in all this carnage and all this cynicism, human relationships and affection still matter and can still bring the best out of everyone. Teresa failing to use her power to bring peace and a more just order to the island, unfortunately was a tragic mistake. And there's a lesson there too. But her legacy lived on through Claire. And it's Claire and the relationships she built through the rest of the series which matter the most and which basically complete the work that Teresa should have completed. Claire became a warrior after Teresa's death, and interestingly, she decides not to take the flesh and blood of a Yoma into her body, but rather Teresa's, as a way to honor her. And the organization thought that this was a worthy experiment. I mean, why wouldn't they? But they considered it a failure and ranked Claire last among the 47 warriors. Because now, what, you're basically only a quarter Yoma rather than a half. But Claire always had a deeper strength within her, and the friendships she builds throughout the series bring this strength out of her little by little. 
It starts with the boy, Rocky. Claire takes him in the same way that Teresa took her in. And Claire then befriends fellow warriors Miria, Deneva, and Helen on a mission that the organization set up for them to fail. Afterward, the four of them become part of the Seven Ghosts, along with Cynthia, Tabitha, and Yuma, Uma. I'm not sure how it's pronounced. The The spelling can be a little weird. But anyway, these are the survivors of the Battle of Pieta, which was another suicide mission that the organization sent them on in order to hold back Easley's advance. Because, you see, Priscilla didn't vanish after killing Teresa. She chanced upon Easley in his northern territory and beat him in battle. Easley knew that with a monster like her, he now had the power he needed to tip the balance and remake the order on the island. And Priscilla, he was going to set her up as the new mistress of the island while he would be her general. This is the muck of part two. The status quo becomes destabilized, and all the factions on the island now go to war for supremacy. And you see that the stakes are high because if anyone other than the Seven Ghosts win, the island will never know peace. Unfortunately, even though they're all now much stronger than they were before the time skip, the Ghosts are still the weakest faction. But you see how the friendship of these seven warriors allows them to exert more power than their fundamentals suggest. Miria is their leader not just because she's strong, but because she knows how to maintain all of these relationships. And it's a skill she carries over into gaining more allies too, because she takes advantage of developments elsewhere to go and destroy the organization when it's at its most vulnerable state. All of the warriors there, including number 10, Raftella, who is supposed to be the anti-warrior, the one trained to put down rebellion, wind up joining her. And that is a testament to Miria's charisma and force of personality. Here is somebody who was like all of these warriors, somebody who felt their pain, but somebody who also had the temerity to resist the organization and show that there was a better way forward. Who could resist something like that if you're one of the Claymores in the organization, right? So through the mutual strength of all these warriors, they can bravely face the odds at the end in the fight with Priscilla herself. And this is Teresa's legacy. Teresa never used her power to forge a better world during her lifetime, but that might have been because until the end of her life, she never had a reason or a hope to do so. But these friends that Claire has made are the fruit of the hope that Teresa has had for a better future in those last days. And Teresa's legacy would manifest in a much more physical way, too, because as we recall, Claire carries her flesh and blood, and through Raffaella, who was the subject of another of those countless failed experiments from the organization, she learns to communicate with Teresa's soul. As a result, Teresa can manifest physically and awaken while keeping her and Claire's humanity. It is the type of warrior the organization has always wanted, and it was all because of a deep relationship where Claire and Teresa valued each other just because of who they were. It's something similar to the philosophy of Immanuel Kant, who stressed that people should be treated as ends in themselves rather than as a means to an end. The organization always treated people as means and never ends, and as a result, were never successful. But Claire treated people as ends in themselves, and she succeeded where they failed as a result. Even Priscilla couldn't cope with this. So these are the relationships that the surviving warriors forged with each other, and they ultimately prevailed over cynicism. And because of that, they were able to create a new order on the island that respects people as people. It frees everyone from the status quo that treated people as pawns of the previous great powers. Claymore does have a few problems, and the biggest one is Priscilla. She's not that interesting of a villain, and she winds up killing off a lot of the better characters. 
Also, like many series of its length and genre, it can wind up dragging in places with some fights that felt overlong. And I also wasn't a fan of a certain plot device to bring back dead warriors toward the end, even though it did wind up being important for the final fight and did raise the stakes. But those are minor things compared to the strength of this series. It's a lot more relevant now than it was in its initial run between 2001 and 2014. At a time when conflict is returning to the world and when people are increasingly being viewed as data, as almost experimental tools, as means rather than ends, Claymore is a series that you need to be looking at. But do you agree with me? Let me know what you think about Claymore in the comments section below. Also remember to hit the like button because each like and comment helps this channel grow a lot. Now what do I mean by this? There's a limited window of opportunity where the algorithm tests your video against a small audience. If it gets a lot of engagement, it will be pushed out more broadly. So each comment and like helps me to rank higher in those metrics. In some ways, we're all experiments. So if you enjoy my videos and want to join me in my fight against the real organization, this is how you do it. And I'd appreciate it because these videos are very hard to make, as you might expect. By the way, thank you for watching all the way to the end. That helps me a lot too. And I want to take a brief moment to thank all of my supporters on Patreon. And here you all are. If you want to join this muster roll and get your name featured in these videos, plus a whole bunch of other goodies besides, the link is in the description. Or you can go to my Ko-fi page and buy one of these scripts individually or just send me a small love letter. The link is also in the description. Next time we're going to be returning to the wild and crazy world of professional wrestling. And you might not be a wrestling fan, but this is going to be on a subject that is well worth your time because it's universal and in a way it's similar to the Odd Girl Out video. The question is, how do you start off with a property that's hot, that gets all the buzz, and then in a year is pretty much ruined and no one really talks about it? Yes, we're going to be looking at the sad history of All Elite Wrestling next time, so stick around for that because you don't want that to happen to your content. Until then, keep writing and keep fighting.